Hello everybody, Tai Chi Twins here. I'm Joshua Rorty. I'm Jeremy Rorty, and welcome to part two of using a walking cane. In part one, we basically highlighted number one, how to use that cane if you needed it for mobility. And then number two, if you needed that for mobility, the limited self-defense techniques that you can actually use in that way. Today, we're gonna to be talking about if you need, don't need the cane as much for mobility, there's some other self-defense techniques that you can use that are really good. Also, we'll be going over some rehabilitation techniques you can use with that walking cane to help you achieve that ability to have to rely on it less. Let's go ahead and talk about using the cane for rehabilitation, making yourself stronger so that maybe you don't even need the cane anymore. So I'm going to start talking about using the cane to rehabilitate the upper body. Let's start with the shoulders. The shoulders, as we get older, can lose a lot of flexibility. For instance, when I was a kid, I used to be able to reach both hands behind my back and be able to link my wrists, which I can't do anymore. But if I have a cane, I can put the cane behind my back and that's going to make it easier for me to grab it with my other hand. And now I could just pull the cane down and stretch this shoulder. Also the opposite way, I can stretch this hand by pulling the cane up and trying to get my hand further between my shoulder blades. And you can just alternate with an exercise like this. On top of that, there's various motions you can make, like bringing it into your chest and doing shoulder presses. Now, if you have more of a limited mobility of your shoulders, you can just grab further out on the cane, and that's not going to stress the shoulders as much. If this is easy enough for you, a little bit more of a challenge would be bringing it behind your head and touching your shoulder and pushing up. That's going to uh, allow the shoulders to move in a little bit for the range of motion. Another thing you can do is the swinging of the cane. You can start by swinging the cane in front of you, up to the sky and down. Now obviously you want to be careful about motions like this and make sure there's no lights or ceiling fans that you're going to hit with it. But besides forward and back, you can also do this going side to side. And these are the general ranges of motion that your shoulder will make. Here's a good exercise if you suffer from tennis elbow. You're going to grab the cane like normal, but then you're going to flip the end over your shoulder. This turns your hand to a forward position. Now I can use my other hand to hold on to the cane and provide a little bit of the resistance as I push the hand out and back. This is going to help strengthen the tricep as well as get the tendons in the elbow to move so you might feel a pop out of it. Here's the key. If you're doing gentle movement and you get a pop, it was an adjustment that needed to be made. Don't force the movement. Now let's take a look at rehabilitating the wrist. These are really good exercises, especially if you suffer from carpal tunnel syndrome. So there's a couple of ranges of motion that a wrist will make. It'll make a side-to-side -side twisting motion, as well as up and down, and some ranges in between as well. So for this first one, if you hold it directly in front of you, I'm going to take the hand that I'm working right up into the crook of the cane. The other hand, I want to grab close to the other hand, not right on top of it. You'll give it a little bit of distance. And what I can do now is use this hand to pull and push. I haven't got a crack out of my wrist right there just to get the side to side flexibility in the wrist. Outside of that, I can also twist up and down. This is going to get all the tendons in the back of the wrist and the front of the wrist moving. On top of that, I can flip my hands upside down and I have a very similar motion I can do this way. You'll feel though that the motion is different just by having the palm up versus the palm down. Also from this upward grip, I can take the side that's the point and get it to go straight up to the ceiling. That's going to twist my wrist into an outside wrist lock. I can also flip it around the other way and pull, giving my wrist the torque of an inside wrist lock. I can also take from this upper grip, I'll take the crook, draw it down inside the body, and then take the point and put it over the top of my shoulder, and that represents a crane lock. 
These are all really good exercises that can not only help re rehabilitate the wrist, but also increase your flexibility and grip strength. Another way you can increase the grip strength with the using a cane is acting like you're twisting a towel. So one thing I want to point out here is you don't want to be too close to the crook for this one because as you go to rotate it, it's going to get caught onto your wrist. So you'll grab it a little ways up and if you watch the crook, I'm going to twist the crook towards coming towards me and then I can also twist it the other way where now the crook's going away from me. You can also switch your hands to be going up and do that same kind of twisting action and it does change it a little bit with the palms facing up versus the palm facing down. You can combine movements of the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist with our basic stick movements. We've got a video on basic stick and staff movements that are very good for increasing the flexibility of the wrist as well as the mobility of the arm in general. You've got your typical downward circles, which is really good on the wrist and really good on the elbow. I can do this circle. As you switch between the two into figure eights, you're actually even getting the shoulder involved a little bit too, strengthening all of the muscles in that structure. In the previous video, we were talking about using the cane for mobility, in which case if my left foot was the injured foot, I would be stepping with my left foot and the cane at the same time. Going sideways, it would look like that. And basically what that's doing is allowing me to have a little support so that I don't have to put so much weight on this leg. Now the problem is if I've been walking on an injured foot, chances are I've changed the way that I've been walking on it. And now that I've rehabilitated it and I've been wanting to get some strength built up in it, I'm going to have to start retraining how I'm stepping. So normally when I walk, I'm stepping heel to toe, and as I step heel to toe here, this foot is rolling up the heel onto the toe. So it's kind of this heel toe motion as I'm walking back and forth. So that's what I'm trying to build here. In this case, instead of having the cane in the opposite hand of the injured foot, I'm going to be using it on the same hand as the injured foot. And so what I'll be doing is stepping out with my unaffected foot and the cane, and as I step up, I'm trying to get this roll of the heel coming up and then going to the toe. As I take my step forward, I have some balance here with this cane and my foot, and I can slowly work on setting my heel down onto my toe. And so I'm going to step forward and lift the heel, step forward again and press, press the heel down. And so that's just going to allow me to start getting my foot doing the right thing, put some extra stress on that knee or that ankle or that foot that I was having issues with before. Now from sitting, there's some techniques I can use with my legs that are pretty much the same thing as what we were doing for the upper body. Number one is if I'm trying to rehabilitate my knee or my hip, I can actually get some resistance going with this cane. Depending on the size of your hook, you might be able to get your whole foot in there. In this case, I'm just getting my first two or three toes inside there, just enough where I can get a good grip on it. In this case, I can pull this cane and get my knee to come close to my shoulder. And I'm bringing this tip of the cane underneath my armpit. And so that's going to be some flexibility things. I can start lifting that in. Opposite side, I can be using this for resistance. And so once I pull it in, I can now push out with my leg and then pull it back. And now I'm using this as a resisted movement. Same thing of just my ankle. If I wanted to do that, again, I'm just going to be hooking my first couple toes inside the cane. And then I can push and pull. I'm pulling for flexibility. I'm pushing for strength. So it's just this back and forth motion. Now, if part of your injury was an injured hamstring, there's flexibility that now becomes an issue because of that muscle rehealing. Besides that, a lot of men have a hard time with the flexibility of their hamstring muscle. I teach this a lot in my martial art classes where people have a belt, as I can put my leg out, hook up that belt over my foot, and I can use that to pull me into the stretch. Same thing for my cane. I can just, again, hook my first couple of toes. If my hook's big enough, I can get my whole foot in there. And then I can just grab up as high up on the cane as I can get. And then I'm going to pull myself into that stretch. Let's discuss the difference between a normal cane versus a combat cane.
The best combat canes don't look like a weapon. However, if you look closely at their crook of the phoenix cane, you'll notice it comes to a very sharp point. This can be handy for pushing into pressure points. A derby style cane will have a knob that protrudes off the end. That can be very good for hammering strikes. Some of them are even pointed. The body of a combat cane can even be carved with special features. In the case of the phoenix cane, you'll notice some diamond style hatching that increases the grip for swinging it like a sword. Also, when applying joint locks, this area can be more abrasive against the skin and bone, creating some pain compliance. Further down the body is carved a spiral pattern, which reduces the surface area and causes a deeper pain when striking. The foot of this cane tapers to more of a point, giving better penetration when thrusting. Keep in mind that if your combat cane looks too much like a weapon, that can be used as a weapon against you in court. Combat is what something I'm going to use if I'm in trouble to get myself out of trouble. So one of the things we showed you in the first video, for instance, is if I need this cane for mobility, I can strike with it just like I'm punching. And with this having a point on it, you can see how much more effective something like that would be. As far as striking with the cane, you can look back at our Kali 24 count. All the techniques from that will work the same with the cane. But now there's the difference of having the hook on the end. That same technique now hitting with the crook is going to provide me more power, as well as being able to not only hit with the cane, but also be able to use the point of the crook to pull them forward. Really effective if I'm striking to the knee and then I can get behind the knee or behind the hamstring. That can really make him want to move. I just want to bring up another similarity we mentioned in the first one. If I've got this cane in front of me and all of a sudden I'm lifting it up like this, he knows it's a weapon, which means he can counter the weapon and maybe even take it away from me. But if I can be holding it in a casual way and I want to strike him in the head and I can swing from here to hit him in the head, it's going to come as much more of a surprise, especially since his eyes are going to be up and they're not going to necessarily see what's happening with the cane. If I do this kind of motion where I'm trying to hit him in the groin and he moves back and I miss, I can now come back down with a typical 24 count swing if I needed to. Next we'll talk about if the opponent is trying to grab you or get control of the cane. Now number one thing is if he just reaches out and grabs my jacket or something, he's wide open there. I've got a lot of these strikes that I can use to the ankle striking here that he's going to have a hard time seeing, let alone defending against. If he's grabbing my wrist, whether, whether it be the outside wrist or the inside wrist, this is really any of my hot keto techniques. I can just grab this hand, bring that over as a strike, and now I've got a joint lock here. Now besides my wrist or grabbing me, what if he's grabbing the cane itself? Very common if he's coming in at me and I use this technique to stop him, he might grab a hold of my weapon. We have a whole video on weapon retention techniques here. In which case, I'm going to reach down and grab this thumb so he can't let go. My idea is to draw this around his wrist and I have a good joint lock there. If I let go of his thumb and push down, I've now just effectively released his grab and now I can come back with counter strike. Now, when it comes to some of these weapon retention techniques, they can be much more effective with a cane rather than a stick. A couple features of this cane that would make it more effective. Number one, it's longer. Number two, I have some extra features here that can make striking with that very effective. So if I am swinging at him in a way where he would catch my weapon, anytime he gets a hold of my weapon, I want to make sure I get two hands on it. And I might even grab his hand while I'm doing this and adds an extra joint lock. But I would be turning this down and getting the strike coming right in here. If the cane was turned around the other way, it would be just as effective. The other thing, if, even if it's that same grip, I've reached in, he's caught this here, I'm turning this down, grabbing his wrist and pushing this into his hip, and now I have this arm bar that I've put in here. The thing that I like to point about this arm bar is once I push that into his hip, I want to push his arm down while I lift this underneath my armpit, and you can see how that gets it right across his hip. If I try to lift it up this way, it's going to slip off. So that's the technique for that arm bar. 
As far as punches are concerned, probably the most effective thing for me to do if he's throwing a punch is using this for a block, or he's throwing a punch, I can use this as a strike right into his arm, and it's going to be much quicker, much more devastating than actually trying to catch that punch and do a joint block. There's easy, even some fancier techniques if I'm having to deal with punches. He's throwing a punch at me, I can block it, I can come around here, catch his throat, and now I have this joint lock with a takedown, I got this tip driving right into his throat. Now, in a way that's kind of unrealistic, this is the way a lot of martial arts would teach it. He throws that punch out, he's keeping that up, that's giving me the opportunity to do this wrap and grab, but chances are if he's throwing a punch, it's going to come out and back really quick. In which case I can still get that, he, I, I can get my block, as he's pulling his hand back, I would follow it in, get this stick up, and I'm still going to have to be quick with that really to be effective. It's going to take a lot of training, you may not actually be able to pull that off in combat. The same technique can be used if he's actually grabbing me. I think this is more effective because he's going to be in this position of his arm straight. He might be trying to pull me around, but the very first thing I'm going to do is secure his hand to me. Then from here, I can take my, my cane and wrap it around, and here's the same technique. I have this a little bit higher, so this is now coming across his throat. You can see the key lock that I'm starting to get here. I can also add a little kick behind the leg to add to this takedown. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, like it and make sure to share that with a friend. Click the subscribe button and then hit that notification bell so you can catch our next exciting video.